on the mountainsides of Appalachia grows a fierce deceptive place. Good morning. It's been my pleasure to uh, be in several classes and have opportunity to uh, meet several of you and have some uh, interesting, intriguing, exciting, challenging, unforeseen possibility conversations. And uh, uh, I hope that I'll be able to share with you some things this morning that, um, um, <clears throat> that you'll find applicable to your own practice, although you may not be interested in doing the things that I'm doing. Uh, you can catch a glimpse of ways you can perhaps reimagine the things you want to do and figure out how to do that. So I want to talk to you about um, um, my work that I've uh, continue to do. And let me begin that by saying <clears throat> I didn't know what in the world I was going to do when I started. All right? So uh, uh, just like uh, any other teacher um, or student, you know, I have spent my entire life saying, I wonder what I'll be when I grow up. And now I'm supposedly grown up and I'm still trying to figure that out. Right, so you know, there's always hope, and uh, and uh, and so we continue on with our ideas. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the um, early things that intrigue me around the idea of family and uh, family care, and then how it ultimately led me into uh, doing this work with uh, uh, prevention of type two diabetes and and self management. So let's begin with uh, uh, just kind of deciphering the differences between uh, an acute illness and a chronic illness, right? This is uh, Health 101. And, uh, uh, but remembering that the needs for acute care are really very different than, um, th than the needs for chronic illness. And when um, my experience in meeting new uh, students coming into nursing, they've all watched uh, some television show uh, that has captured their imagination and they're going to spend their lives saving lives. And so uh, we prepare people very often to work in acute care settings in, uh, in health care and, um, and don't think so much beyond that. Uh, chronic illness, on the other hand, uh, tends to be uh, defined as a persistent illness that lasts longer than six months. Now, if it's, uh, you know, it's five months, five months and 28 days, it might still be, right? So it, it's, it's kind of a rough guess. But it's a disease that's going to be continuing, and it's going to need uh, sort of some forms of intensive care or therapy over an extended period of time. And if you're aware of what's going on today, we have great needs in the area of chronic illness. Um, they're predicting that most of us live long enough. We'll have five or six of them. Wow, that's great. We're looking forward to that, aren't we? And unfortunately, most nurses, as we're preparing them, we're not really thinking about living with illnesses for this extended period of time. And so we wind up thinking only about getting them well right now, fixing up that problem, and sending them on. Our healthcare system, though, is going to be demanding some differences, and we're still trying to figure out a little bit about what that's going to look like in the actual practice of care and what that's going to ultimately mean in the education of nurses as they pursue um, this, this uh, line of career. The World Health Definition of Health. You've all heard that a number of times, I'm sure. Uh, the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease. Now, we all know that, but somehow it so seems to get driven back in our thinking, often in the practices that we do every day. However, when we encounter real people and listen to their real story, we find out they're very concerned about the holistic aspects of their lives and not just merely getting over the illness. Of course, if you're in pain, you always want the pain to go away. Or if you're bleeding, you want the bleeding to stop. Right? But it, once we get that taken care of, then the intensity of the lived experience comes forward and people are very engaged in what does that mean and how am I going to, to manage these other aspects of my life. So a few things about health care. Um, you're, you're discovering as you're doing your studies how much literature is out there. I never cease to be amazed, even at this point, 
how many new things I can find to study and learn about every day. My email is continually filled up with new things that I don't know about. All right, so every day we're adding to that body of knowledge and that body of literature, the accessibility of things. Uh, uh, some of you might remember what card catalogs look like <laughs> right, in libraries. Right, so when you actually went in, you pulled out the drawer and you hunted through it, and, or the sin all books that we look things up, you know. That's really ancient history now, but it was only 20 years ago. And, and in that 20 years, our world of knowledge has changed. The accessibility to us as clinicians, as professionals, and consumers has enlarged so much that we have really uh, um, a very small conception of what that really means. And we are not there yet. So every day it gets bigger. Every day it gets bigger. Um, how big can the website be? How big can that knowledge be? Some of us remember in the early 90s when we just started being introduced to the internet and the web and, and some of that uh, language. Right, that virtual world that was such a mystery that now we carry it in our pockets. Right? We all have some of that world with us most of the time. Um, <clears throat> and before long, it'll keep getting smaller and it will be part of us. It will, you know, I know people who are just attached to those phones right now. Right? But we'll be wearing these sensors and things and it may even be feeding us knowledge before we ask the question. Uh, you know, I, I think the sky's the limit. We don't know exactly what is out there in the future. But we do know that, we're, that we have lots of knowledge and most of us don't access it. Most of us don't know it. Most of us don't know how to link it. But we're going to have demands for that as we look forward in the future. You know, so just having knowledge accessible, we have to be able to interpret it. We have to be able to use it to make it useful to us and others. Right now we're spending billions of dollars in medical research and much of this money uh, uh, is, is um, um, discovering things but not necessarily being used for things. So they say it takes us 17 years from the time we learn something to when we actually are adopting it and using it. And that's only some things. Right? Many things never get out into the public domain or we never rediscover them. So it's very challenging even when you begin to think about a study project is reviewing the literature to find out what's already been done, what do we know, and what can, uh, kinds of questions we can develop to build upon for the future. Uh, <clears throat> I might get in trouble here, but I'm going to risk it. Uh, uh, we call it health care, but it's really illness management. Right? What we really do today in most of our healthcare settings is we manage illness. And, uh, and, and I like to say we may not do it really well in some cases, but in other cases it's miraculous. It's amazing what we can do. Um, uh, severed limbs can be put back together. I mean, things that we never thought possible are possible these days. And so we, we're, um, we're learning every day about the possibilities of things. But those things are, are often uh, a little bit like saving lives and not necessarily like living with the problem once we save the person. So, uh, uh, Nick, you, Eunice, where's, where's my Zimmerman? Okay. <laughs> right, we've been talking about NICU units some today uh, over the last uh, few days. And, and so, uh, you know, we can save those babies. We know how to do that. Spend, send, spend billions to do that, but then the parents don't know how to take care of them when the child goes home. So somehow we're missing some really important things. Uh, many people get much too much care and some people don't get any care. So we have inequality in our systems as well. And, um, and we often look at how many cases we see or the number of people we're giving care to, but we don't do a really good job in measuring the quality of that care and what are those, especially, specifically the long-term outcomes. What we look at is not really far enough out. Just because they leave the hospital on time and we get paid doesn't necessarily mean we've done a fine job. Um, and if we examine things from the perspective of the consumer, we would get really different stories uh, as well. So um, 
those of you to watch to have time to watch television. I know most of you are too busy these days probably to do that, but uh, you might say, ask your doctor if taking a pill to solve all your problems is right for you. And that's kind of the where much of society seems to be. Uh, we have marketed pharmaceuticals so well that everybody thinks there's a pill for everything. And that if I could just get the right medicine, then this, whatever this problem is, it'll go away. And unfortunately, it doesn't do that. Um, some things work really well. Like if you take your, uh, um, your medicine for hypertension, it really can control your blood pressure pretty much uh, in many cases. Uh, but there's other things that don't work as easily. The diseases tend to be more complex and complicated. So let me talk to you a little bit about family and how um, uh, kind of where I have uh, uh, started from and continued to be going, I think. Uh, defining family is quite interesting. When I started all of this, you know, 20-something years ago, uh, we really looked at nuclear family, mom, dad, you know, a boy and a girl, a dog and a cat, and television and a car or two in the, in the driveway. Uh, families don't look very much like that anymore uh, in our nation. They, they look any way you can imagine. And so coming up with a definition that's sort of a collective uh, to cover all families is a challenging thing. I just am teaching some graduate students right now and I always have them define families. So that's how I keep up with things because I learn from my contemporaries how they're defining family. And it's a long way from that old traditional uh, kind of def definition. I'm not going to read these to you, but these are a couple. Uh, Irma Bombeck, some of you might have read her things in the past. She's quite humorous and, uh, as to how we might define family. And you have your definition of family. And what I like to say is um, it's kind of the pain definition. Pain is whatever people say it is, and it happens whenever they say it does. All right? that, so that's kind of how I define family. Family is whatever individuals say it is, and it happens however they say it happens. And, uh, and I found that works pretty good. And sometimes people's definition of who they include in that family changes over time. So at a young age, we may define family one way, but then as we grow older, go to, off to, to school, I mean, aren't these people family? Right? or like family that you're now associated with. They, they understand you better than some other people in your real family, uh, perhaps, or at least part of, of who you are. So the way we define family changes over time. And <clears throat> I just started putting some words together one day to kind of get some ideas. I and mean, I probably could go on for slides, right? because there's many words that we associate with the idea of family as we're thinking about that that are quite important in understanding the, the, the largeness of that concept. But most of us love our families. And <clears throat> I don't know about your family tree, but I got a lot of nuts on mine. <clears throat> and and, and um, uh, we don't always uh, choose our families. Uh, we sort of inherit them. But we add people into our family or adopt people into our family in other ways as well. And because I love my family, when a family member gets ill or has a concern or a need, I care. I'm involved. I want to be part of that. And what we find in healthcare settings is that we meet people and we make rules about who can be family, when they can be there, and how involved they're going to be in that care. And most of the time, we think of ourselves as the gatekeeper or the decision maker as to what those are. Maybe they're not our rules, but they're the policy of the, of the institution where we're employed, but they do guide our behaviors. So there's some current concerns that we have uh, when, we, when we think about healthcare in general. One is we, we heavily rely on health professionals. Now, what we know is that we don't have enough of us. There's not enough of us, and no matter what we do, we're not going to have enough of us to cover everything that we have laid out in illness management or health care to provide for all of those potential needs. So the models we have created in the past may not be fully relevant for the future. We may need to rethink things, and so some of the things that are happening now are really looking at community health workers, a less skilled person to do some things. Uh, um, and we've done this before, right? Nurses' aides do some work that only nurses did at one time. 
but we have scaled back on things. LPNs do some work. Um, and so we may have to think about a different type of, of healthcare worker in the future. There is this belief that all problems can be solved, but that's not true now, it never was, and probably never will be, at least in our foreseeable future. We have a mobile population, so, so uh, people tend, I work in the Appalachian region, so I see a lot of close families staying close for generations. However, uh, that's not typical of the mainstream in our nation or the world. People are moving, they're very flexible. Um, um, we're worried about diseases in rural communities that we would have never considered. Bed bugs, for instance. You all know about bed bugs, right? You can get bed bugs in rural places because city people come there. <laughs> it must be those city people that bring those things, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but things change. So this mobile population means that there's, there's an influx of ideas and changing and transition and it's continuous. We tend to have smaller families. Uh, here in Appalachia, my mother had six brothers and sisters and that was considered a small family, right? Because general family size was 10 or more. And um, uh, we don't see that anymore. Now we see uh, a, a two and maybe even less. And not only that, we're seeing that families are not being started till much later. So rather than having that first child at 19, uh, now they might be 29 or 32 or 38. My niece just had her first child at 36 and then quickly had two more. Right, so that's a real different picture than we saw in the past. And we're, uh, we're living longer. Um, or at least that's what the, the trajectory looked like. I'm going to show you some things that makes it look a little different at the present. But by and large, we're certainly living longer than they did at the time of World War II. Right? And we have that perspective in front of us. Um, we're, we're seeing new demands on family caregivers uh, because of the growing number of chronic illnesses, because of the aging of the population, because of the smallness of the families. The burden on caregivers, that family person who's helping is difficult. Not only that, most people are working. Some people are working more than one job and time is fragmented and challenging and difficult. And on top of all that, we don't really think about wellness and prevention for the most part. Now some people do, but those of us in, in healthcare by and large do not focus on that uh, very much. So. So I, I want to talk a little bit to you about two models of care, the medical model and what I call the family health model. The family health model is, comes out of the work that the research that I've done around family health and a model that uh, I put together from that research. <clears throat> I'm not going to try to teach you the model, but I want to talk to you about this idea of care that can come out of that. Most of us learn from the family, from, excuse me, from a medical model. What we learn is uh, patient is the unit of care, all right? It's all about the patient. We talk about patient, all right? I, I would say from a family health model, I don't talk about patient. I try not to. I, I, I slip into that pattern and sometimes use that dirty word. Um, but what I like to talk about is individual and person because then that gives them a personality. It gives them a name. It gives them a, a position or a social standing and I can respect them differently. When I call someone a patient, I put them in a, lump them into a group and they all look alike. So medical model, patient, family model, family is the unit of care. That's a different way of thinking. So let me talk on a little bit more. When most of us in nursing learn, we learn about systems models. You all remember that? Input, throughput, output, feedback loops. Right, homeostasis, remember all those things? Okay, so we learned that. And I remember my first learning of that, which seemed to adhere for a long time, is that it was some kind of a linear continuous pattern. All right, because that's the kind of the way I learned it, you know. I never really understood that there were multiple systems interacting together and how complex that could be. So over time, I began to be exposed to an ecological model, which helped enlarge that thinking. And, and, and allow for the complexity of those interactions. In a medical model, we aim to treat the individual, right? Get them well, send them home, fix them up, repair, and then our work is done. 
in a holistic model, we're really looking at the wholeness or the health of that whole family unit and the complexity of what that might mean. Medical model has most immediate needs. In a family model, we're looking more at lifetime needs. I'm considering the present. I'm looking at what the past might have meant in the present and perhaps in the future. Episodic care from a medical model versus care over the life course. If I'm only seeing people now, and for a very brief period of time, I think about fixing what needs to be taken care of right now in this particular episode. I do not necessarily think about the conversation I'm having includes the past, the present, and potentially the future. I'm thinking about what do they need when they leave me? What kinds of things might they need? In a medical model, we see the individual as the re reservoir of health and illness. It's their fault. They did something wrong. You know, uh, if, they, if it's going to be fixed, it's their responsibility. And then we grade them, you know, dysfunctional, non-adherent. You know, well, I'll give them an A, they're adhering. You know, so we kind of grade them that way. But in the family health model, I look at the household, the family household as the reservoir of health and illness. We get well and sick together in our homes. And, and very often people have similar conditions and, and uh, similar risk factors for other conditions. <clears throat> in a medical model, the, 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 uh, the physician uh, and maybe us as nurses uh, might be a primary care provider. Certainly DMPs will be a primary care provider. However, in the family health model, we look at the family and particularly the mom in, in many cultures as the provider. Mom makes the appointments, mom makes sure the medicine is taken care of, mom often does the shopping and decides what's getting to be cooked or microwaved or, and sets the tone often for that family. We see medical model in the medical model that the provider is the expert. In the family model, we're looking at the family as the expert. Now, that often makes nurses cringe, because how could they be expert? They may not have the knowledge we have, but they have the expertise of knowing their own experience, and that makes them an expert. Doctor makes decision in the medical model. The reality is individuals and families always really make the decisions. Right? They're living a life outside of our, our sight, and they're making those decisions. So. If we look at family-focused care, <clears throat> we, we can see, divide that up, all right? Because often what we see is um, uh, a difference between family that's the context of care or family that's the unit of care. If family is the context of care, we're looking at them as sort of background noise. Ugh, those people, they're always in that room, right? Oh, well, here they come again. Right? You know, we're kind of looking at them as outsiders who kind of interfere uh, uh, sometimes with, with the good things that we're trying to do. We're trying to help that person, and there's all those people hanging out in the waiting room, here calling 12 times a day. They're in the way. What do we do with them? Um, however, as if we look at from a family as a unit of care, we understand that the, that the individual is part of that family and part of that unit of care and has just as great of need. And they're going to be the caregivers. They're going to be the support people. They're the ones who need to know what has to be changed or different in their household. Family is individuals versus family is a whole unit. Right? We, ha we don't really stop and think about family as a whole unit, except in our own families. Right? Then we begin to understand, well, I can't do this because so-and-so needs this, or uh, you know, I can't spend the money on this because we have to spend the money on that. Right? And those are the internal decisions that we make. <clears throat> in, the, in the family as context of care, we see that we care for in these individuals, whereas in the unit of care, we see that every time we meet an indiv individual, it provides the potential to care for the family. I'm going to say that again because that's important. Right? Every time we see an individual, we see that with potential that it gives us to care for the family. So that the instructions that we're given, even if we're giving them to the individual, have, could have implications for that family life that happens when they leave my presence as a nurse. 
So family nursing has uh, some different kinds of perspectives. One of the dangers that we get into with, fam with talking about family nursing is most people think they're expert because we all have one. We all have a family. And so we kind of think, well, I know about that. I, you know, I have a family and I live with that. But we have one experience of a family. Uh, maybe you remember earlier in your life when you went to your best friend's house and either discovered that it was a mess and you don't want to ever go back there, it makes you uncomfortable, or their family was so cool, right? You could do all of these things um, with that family that you couldn't do with your family. And you may have noticed some difference. But we tend not, in practice, with everything else, the stress of the work that we're doing, we tend not to stop and think about what is the difference between families, or what are the unique needs that different families have. We take courses in culture, we understand that these things exist, but how do we actually uh, uh, bring those in to the work that we do? And so I like to talk about the idea of family nursing being intentional involvement. And one of the things in, when I teach the uh, students is I, I talk to them a lot about reflection. Every time you have a patient encounter, every time you have a, a, an individual that you're working with in care, when you walk away, you don't say, wow, glad that's over, or boy, I did a good job. You try to stop and reflect about what was that experience I just had? What did I do right, and what might I have done differently? It's in that stopping and reflecting that we can grow in our practice, especially when we're outside of the educational setting. You know, here we drive you to keep reading, reading, reading. But ultimately, it's about practice. And that practice has to involve something beyond the things we can quote out of books. Right? It has to involve real engagement with those people we give care for. And that involves communication. There's a lot of other things about family nursing we could talk about, but I'm going to skip over some of those things. So <clears throat> what I like to talk about is think family. Every time I see an individual, every time I'm in a, a care situation, I think family. And that means even when that person is by themselves. Even, even though I'm not seeing anyone else, I realize this person is representing a household. They're representing a way of life that they share with another group of people that's really important to them and has great implications for their health and their illness patterns. And the things, I have this few minutes with them, what can I do to help them understand ways to look at their own life differently and go back into their environment? So I'm really thinking a whole lot of these days about how do we transform nursing practice, right? I, I, I'm on a revolution. Anyone want to join a revolution? <laughs> right? We need to start a revolution because what we're doing isn't working. We've had reports over several years from the Institute of Medicine, from the Pew uh, report, and I could go on and on, that tell us many things about what we're doing is not working. And now we have uh, a financial bill for our illness care that at the rate it's going, we're up to almost 18% of our, our federal budget now for health care. What's going to happen in five more years or 10 more years? When is the right time to make a change? And I'm saying, let's have a revolution. Um, we have three million or more nurses in our country. We can make a big difference if we start thinking about nursing in some different ways than we do now. We need to uh, uh, quit thinking about technologies as the way we do. Um, nurses right now have more tools and gadgets and things that we work with than physicians ever thought about uh, two generations ago. What they carried in that little black bag, we have much more expertise with than what they, what they have. But you know, people want the technology, but they want to know that we recognize they're a person. And persons have actual needs that we often fail to, to meet. Sometimes the, the people who have the greatest needs in health care uh, or illness care ha are the least prepared to really take care of themselves. And we often don't spend time. We spend time in class talking about literacy and low health literacy and clear communication. But what do we do when we're actually in practice? Would, what would our grade be 
if somebody was really looking over our, our shoulder in the way we talk to people, the nonverbals that we uh, uh, give off in our day-to-day -day interactions. How frequently do we not know the real cause or the problem or the answer, and how frequently do people we're giving care to leave our presence and they don't know what they're supposed to do? They have no understanding about what just happened and they're off to take care of those um, uh, diseases and illnesses and pains that cause them such agony. We tend not to understand the way families interact and what those needs are in the lived experience and we need to think more uh, uh, about what that means. So hearing the story is, is something I like to say and most nurses say I would love to hear the story but I don't have time. And, and, and so we sometimes think about that as, okay, I'm going to sit down over a cup of coffee and we're going to have a little chat. Well, that's never going to happen in practice. But what I like to think about is the idea of, of we, we begin to think about the care that we provide as more continuous. We talk about coordinated care, but we talk about it in the sense of an in, uh, inpatient or an acute care situation. So what we're talking about is when they get transferred to ER and they go to surgery and then they go to a, a PACU unit or a med, med surge uh, a unit that we have coordinated care, that we make sure things. And I want to talk about coordinated care as what happens before they come to, to the care, whether it's in an acute setting where they're going to spend the night or whether it, come, it means that they're coming into an office setting and what, me, what happens when they go home? What do they really take with them besides a prescription? Uh, what do they take in their memory or their mind or what do they share and what, what have we learned about their real life outside of that clinical setting that we met them in? We can talk about um, uh, quality of life in the term of, of, of the number of years we live. And most of us, especially nurses, you know, we say, well, we don't, I, I'm a DNR, I don't want to be re resuscitated. No tubes for me, right? No resuscitation for me. But what is the quality of life we offer in most of our health acute care centers? And how do we need to think about that different? And how do we work with the families? I would like to say that in nursing, we have done a relatively poor job in, in educating nurses how to communicate. It was in your foundations course. Most of us never had anything else. And what we learned in that foundations course was something about a message and a sender and a hearer and we had a little diagram and, and you know, and, and, um, and, and what we walk away from that, and usually our teacher is somebody who doesn't really know anything about communication, it just happens to be in the book and in that section, so you get taught that. Even though there's a college of communication across campus, you never meet those people who are the experts. Right, you just get it from us who are nurses. And so what we learn about communication is how to talk to a patient, right? Not a person, not an individual, a patient. I am the expert, you are the patient, I will educate you now, right? And so that, what that does is it gives us two guns and we try to shoot them all. <laughs> we, we go out and we feel armed with messages to give and so it turns out to be many lectures to people. Um, and we hardly catch our breath to say, do you have any questions? And if they do, we look at our watch and we say, okay, I only have 30 seconds. You know, and, and, uh, so, and so we're thinking about that really, really different. If we call individuals partners in care, right? Go back and look at some of your mission statements. Some of them may actually say this, uh, that the people we serve are partners in care. I would ask you, are they really partners? Is that some, is, you know, it, would you want to be that kind of a partner where you get told what to do, you have little input into real decisions, and you get little communication about what it is you're going to do with what you're, what's happening to you, and you leave really not understanding even what your problem is or how to take care of it, and your family doesn't know either. That's the state we seem to give ourselves in. I like the butter. Uh, this actually one of the projects I did, I had a photographer work with me to take pictures of real life experiences of, of people living with type 2 diabetes and this is one of the pictures he brought me back which is one of my favorites because that's it, you know, the insulin's in the refrigerator on top of the butter and that's part of my life but I, 
I have a whole other life and it has to, this disease or this illness or this problem somehow has to fit into that situation. So we're talking about patient-centered care, which somehow includes family, but we never really talk about it in that term. All right, we still begin to talk about, we're gonna to listen to the patient, all right? It's still that sort of dependency model. We tend to fail to include family in all the ways, and we definitely, uh, or very seldom, look at how do we really support caregivers in their real needs. We've got a sort of a, an assertive population coming up in some places um, who are asking questions, and many of us, uh, and, and, and probably not you, because you're definitely the brightest, or you wouldn't be here, right? I recognize that, uh, preaching to the choir here. Uh, but many staff nurses, you know, when, they're, uh, uh, when they encounter someone who's assertive or ask questions, they get labeled. They get avoided. They get ignored. Because if we don't know the answer, we're not comfortable saying, you know, I really don't know the answer to that which is a fairly re legitimate, I have to go Google it, <laughs> right? No. Um, let me go to my, my space and I will Google that and come back and tell you, you know. Um, uh, so, and so we have to find different ways to begin talking and communicating about the needs uh, for the care we want to deliver. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days, a year adds up to 8,760 hours in a year. Now I want to point that out, that's a lot of time. Although it goes fast and it doesn't always seem that much. M most of us don't spend any time with the doctor, but for people who actually have chronic illnesses, they might spend a a a one or two hours a year you know, this is not, this is if you're doing well and you're still living at home in the community. This is with your medical visit. You might spend an hour or two during the course of a year with a medical professional. And then you have 8,758 hours you spend by yourself. Nobody telling you what to do, nobody looking over your shoulder, nobody encouraging you or supporting you. And if we do not work with families, to figure out how to support one another in those home environments, we're gonna continue having what we have now, which is large non-adherence to the medical regimens for, uh, for diabetes management, right? About 30% of people who have diabetes actually manage their disease well. That's disconcerting to me. So the current literature that we have now, if you went and did a lit literature search, you'd find that there's strong evidence that, that we learn he about health and illness in our homes. Our parents start those teachings, you know, we learn about washing hands and brushing teeth, all those hygiene things, that really has to do with health. Now, we still can't get nurses and doctors to wash their hands, but we're trying to teach that in our, in our homes. There's been little research that's investigated the uh, whole complexity of family health and what that means in a lived experience of where people spend the most part of their time and what the implications are for the way they uh, either get sick, stay healthy, or manage disease or other kinds of problems that they might have. And we don't know very much about what he how we promote healthy lifestyles. Now I think they know a little more out in Colorado all right, uh, maybe we should start investigating those families because when you look at the CDC maps, you see those people are healthier than any place else in the nation. So what's going on there that's different? You know, what kinds of, is it, is it health professionals or is it social environment, All right? So <clears throat> the American Association of Diabetes Educators, anyone here a diabetes educator? I'm not one. I can never get the thousand clinical hours in that they want me to have, so I'll never be one, right? You, you know, we, rules. Got these rules that we make that we think protect people, so I can never be a CDE uh, because I can't uh, pass the test. These are the things that we look at, though, um, uh, if you're going to be a CDE, all right? These are the areas of care that you need to teach people about. And, uh, and each one of these things begins to become very complicated. So again, the literature suggests that uh, people are largely non-adherent. 
right? About 30% are all, all that we actually see that really follow those things we tell them in the office. And that one to two hours we have, uh, you know, about 30%. One out of every three people you see is actually going to do what you say. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Think about that. And, 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 and it's the same one out of three people. Right, so when you talk about patients, now we label them. That's, I got a good patient here. They do what I say. The, the rest of them are bad patients. You know, do we say that? Well, maybe I'll say that, but you know, we think, what's wrong with them? Why don't they do what I say? Um, in all of the research I've done over pretty much a decade in uh, interviewing families living with type 2 diabetes and working with them in, the different, uh, in different ways, what I have learned is that what often happens is they go in, they don't necessarily have symptoms for some, they go in with often complications. Here in Appalachia, people often have the disease five or six years before they're ever diagnosed. And what really brings them in for care is they just had a heart attack and then they find out they also have type 2 diabetes. But the diagnosis was never made early on because what they get told is, you know, you're pre-diabetic. If you don't, uh, uh, you need to eat different. You need to change your eating and, and get a little more active and quit smoking. Right? Just, and come back and see me in three months. And the person comes back in three months and the doctor says, you know, if you keep acting like this, you're going to be on insulin. You know, we, we, we have a lot of these threats and things that we give people, and, and so we delay the diagnosis of the disease. Meanwhile, the person is developing the disease, the disease is growing and it's getting worse, and by the time we actually diagnose them, their se severe damage uh, uh, complications already happen. How many of you can change your lifestyle easily? All right, you know, New Year's Eve, Got new, new Year's resolutions. You know, maybe you make it through January 1. But usually, you know, a lot of us, by the end of the week, you know, it's like, well, maybe next year, right? Maybe next year. So changing your lifestyle is not easy. If you need to change, you know, you want to give up pop, or you want to uh, drink more water, or you want to walk more, or get more physical activity, how easy is that to change? And yet, we tell people that as if it's just, you know, you just go out, snap your fingers, and it happens. Well, it's not that easy. If it was easy, we would all be in good health. Uh, we wouldn't have those, have those problems at all. So I'm working on a book right now. Hopefully, it'll be out in about a year. And the book's called Think Family, Transform Nursing Practice. And, um, and it uses this whole idea of thinking family every time I encounter an individual, every time I meet a person. And it includes this idea of intentional reflective practice so that I really am thinking about what I'm doing. Not that I can check it off, not that I'm going to document it. I'm thinking of it in terms of what did I just do and was it the best thing I can do and how can I, how can I make that better? And, or I was really uncomfortable with that situation I was just in. What was it about that situation that made me so uncomfortable and made me feel squirming? And made, you know, I don't want to go down there and talk to that family again. What is it about that that makes me not want to go there? And what kind of work do I need to do on me so that I can be better prepared the next time I encounter them or somebody like them? Do they remind me of someone in my own family that I don't really get along with? What is it? Right? Without that reflection, we just go on. And very often we find ourselves going to the car at the end of the day saying, whew, made it through. Good day, got everything done I was supposed to, I think I did good. But if we could interview the people we interacted with, the, the privacy we invaded, the opportunities we missed during the course of the day, perhaps our grade wouldn't be quite as high uh, as what we want to grade ourselves. So uh, I, I like, in the, in the book I'm talking about an individual nurse family relationship. Right, so that I, I enter a situation because the person appears to me, and that's the way it is right now. We don't have a way to, to actually go out and uh, engage others very much in our uh, current systems. In this relationship, I'm thinking about, okay, I'm encountering, but I'm thinking of this as an individual nurse family relationship so that every time I see that individual, 
I'm connecting that they have a family and that family is important in the health and wellness of this particular person. What do I need to think about? What kinds of questions do I need to ask? Um, what kinds of things do I need to communicate uh, with or assess? Or what kind of stories do I need to hear? Now, the stories don't have to be real long, but they have to be appropriate to the situation. And it's not a skill that you gain immediately, but it's a skill that you work at and you can learn over time. <clears throat> now, we do this really pretty well. We're doing this much better, I should say, in children's hospitals. So if you go to most uh, children's hospitals around the country, you, you'll find that we're, we're doing much better in family care. We're including parents, we're teaching them, we're, we're engaging them, we're, we're looking more than their comfort. They can stay overnight. We teach them how to do things. We sit down and we talk to them, we interact. We provide spaces in the hospital for them to be comfortable and be home-like because we know that they're often there uh, away from their own homes. I have a child inside of me that never grew up. I don't know about the rest of you. Is there a child inside you? Huh? Is there still? You know, when you get sick, what do you want? Somebody to care for you, right? Someone close by. You, we, we all have the same needs. We may be adult and independent, but when it comes to crisis in our family, who are we going to call? Right? Who's the first person that we call? And where do we want them? We want them close. And that does not change. So, so the interactions might be somewhat different with adults and adult families, but the needs are not less. And unless we begin this revolution, we're going to keep doing what we're doing and things will not change. So let me talk now a little bit about Appalachia. Right? This is um, uh, the Appalachian region. And how many of you are from Appalachia? Maybe I should say how many are not. All right, so there's some that aren't. So the, for those of you that aren't, although some people that live in Appalachia don't realize how large a territory this is, it follows the uh, Appalachian mountain range. It's about 205,000 square miles of territory, mostly rural. Um, it's divided usually into the northern, central, and southern region. Um, uh, Tennessee is uh, kind of in some in the central and some in the south, right? Yeah, it's one of those uh, uh, more divided uh, states. Uh, 13, part of 13 states uh, make up Appalachia. Only West Virginia is the only state that's totally Appalachia. And um, this is an area that's grown over time. And we're very concerned about this geographic region because it seems to be a little different. It was identified in the 1960s as a, a place where poverty and um, uh, low education and, and poor roads and... and uh, this, you know, and this is where we had the culture of poverty uh, discussion back in the 60s uh, largely came out of recognizing this area. So I want to show you a few maps, though, that, that pertain to the Appalachian region. And a few of you were in the community health class that I uh, talk with, so you've seen some of these. But that dark blue is Appalachia. And that dark blue means these are the people who are the least in our nation. And when you look at these CDC maps, you very quickly see this is, this is an area you would not expect to see us being the least active because we were hardworking people in this area until two generations ago. People were out, they were you know, doing hard labor, um, uh, times were tough, and, and we had hard lives, uh, physically hard lives, and lots to do. But we have convenienced ourselves so much that we mostly have leisure time, even though we're not calling it that. Um, and it, most of our work is mental, and we mostly sit around. And we don't exercise, we don't get physical activity. This map uh, shows you the difference between the healthiest part of the nation and the least healthy. Uh, part of the nation as far as obesity, diabetes, and uh, physical activity. And so you see out west, they get outside a little bit more. They, they're, they're, they're doing something a little different. That real pink state's out of Colorado. Right? So maybe we should just all move there and we'll catch whatever it is they have. But again, the part of the country that has the greatest risks appears to be the, this geographic region where we actually live. 
This map shows um, um, the problem of obesity across the nation in two to four year olds. And you can see it's not just Appalachia that has a problem. We have a problem with obesity nationwide. And this map, um, although it's a few years old, I kind of wonder how in the world do they even get this data when I talk to schools and they tell me they don't measure kids or nobody really has records exactly of how many people are really obese. So I, I want to guess that this is an inaccurate map, that the problem is really worse. And if you don't think that, then go to Walmart after 10 p.m. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, or go to the county fair and walk around you know, and see uh, the condition we have found ourselves in. And um, we don't look like we used to 20 years ago, 40 years ago as a nation of people. We look very different. Uh, obesity then is a growing problem in the country and again you can begin to see this map looks a little different than some of the others and it includes uh, Texas. Texas uh, thinks it's a country unto itself but it really is a lot like the rest of the nation and, and uh, uh, there are a lot of similarities in it. Very rural in most of Texas and uh, see some common things there as well. Also see minorities so minority groups also Appalachians are not a minority group. We're largely Caucasian, and so we have not been classified as a minority group. And so um, um, some folks, I've, I've run into a couple of people along the way who, who are just irate with the idea that we're labeling a geographic region as a minority concern. Um, it's not that it's a minority concern, it's a geographic concern um, of this particular region. And so when we look at the um, uh, diabetes map from 2009, we can see what has now been called the diabetes belt. And that uh, comes uh, down the Appalachian Mountains and then up the East Coast, where a lot of minorities actually are, uh, that, that southern part and that eastern part. And then there's all that fried chicken that goes along with it, right? the way we cook and eat and, and exercise. So, Diabetes is a global problem. It's not just, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Appalachian region. It's a problem for our nation as a whole. Um, we have almost 26 million people that have it. About 79 million, we think, are pre-diabetic. In other words, that's a little bit of the iceberg underneath that we haven't uh, really uh, had the diagnosis for, but we think that they're at risk. <clears throat> excuse me, about three weeks ago, um, a paper was published that uh, demonstrated the increased cost of diabetes, and so in 2007, uh, we spent about $174 billion on this disease, and in 2012, um, the amount went up to $245 billion. That's a 41 increase in the amount of money spent on diabetes in five years. What's going to happen in the next five years? Right, these are the kinds of questions we need to be asking ourselves um, uh, because diabetes is one of the leading causes of complications. When you look at the causes of death, diabetes is number seven. But that's because people die of heart attacks and that ends up being the cause of death. But if you could look at that secondary uh, diagnosis that they have, they probably have diabetes as well. Every time the, a person with diabetes goes in the hospital, even for a brief stay, they're spending about $18,000. And if, if we realize <clears throat> the, the problem of diabetes was largely an older person and it still is largely an older person problem, uh, 55 to 65 and older. Uh, however, it's getting to be a problem for 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, teens. How many teens do you know that either have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or are at, definitely at risk for it right now? And what we, had, what we do know for, about type 2 diabetes is that mo when most people live with the disease for 20 years, non-adherent, which is what most of them are, what happens? They get really serious complications and they don't live very long. And so we're looking at an aging population starting now with our teenagers who are already at risk for type 2 diabetes who, if they continue their lives as they are, probably will not live beyond 50 50 years old, or they will live with very uh, serious complications related to the disease. Something that all of us as nurses in practice and education or as practitioners need to be thinking about how do we talk to everyone about that, 
this whole idea of lifestyle management. This is a family problem. It's not just an individual problem. And how do we begin to, to talk about that in some different ways? So uh, this is a picture that uh, sort of been painted of the, of, of the future. 82% of men and 72% of women will be overweight or obese by 2050. I probably won't be here to see that. Sorry. Um, but you will. Uh, many of you will. And um, that's, that's everybody. I don't know if you've seen the movie Wally. It's a cartoon kind of Pixar movie. If you haven't seen it, take a look at it because that's us. We're heading in that direction. Um, and if you have obesity, if you have diabetes, your risks for many diseases are increased, including cancer uh, as well, which we're also concerned about. We're reducing the number of people that have uh, uh, tobacco use. But as we're decreasing that, the number of obesity is going up. We're replacing one habit with another addiction, right? So we're moving from one to the other. We've got to do something. We've got to get people addicted to activity, right? Being active rather than eating, uh, which is what we're largely doing now. Currently, 32% of men, 34% of women are obese, and they're predicting by 2020, that's seven years from now, 43% of men and 42% of women will be either overweight or obese. We're moving there too quickly. And there's a prediction that prediabetes is in, uh, predicted to increase over the next 20 years from 6.3% to 37%, and women from 8.3% to 44%. So, so we have a dire prediction, you know, um, and it's really of concern. So we have a disease that's common. You ask, uh, particularly here in the Appalachian region, if people don't have it, ask them if there's anyone in their family that does. And they usually can recite numbers of names for you. It's a serious disease. It's costly. But it's controllable and preventable. Pharmaceutical companies, do they care? Oh, we're not going to go there. <clears throat> I'm on being filmed. So. The work that I've done has been a variety of things around the whole idea. Uh, I spent much of my earlier career really with this um, concept, some concept of what is family health and what is family health routines. And out of that then I developed a model. And um, I haven't spent my career really trying to promote the model. What I've tried to do is really think through that model myself in the work that I've done to see if it, it allows me to act different think different, work different, teach different, um, and hopefully practice different. I've mainly looked at Appalachian um, families, so I've done a lot of things around Appalachian health issues be besides diabetes earlier on. Um, and I've done some environmental scans, so I have done some quantitative things where I've looked at um, uh, survey data and things in relationship to particularly health care uh, provision and diabetes in Appalachia. <clears throat> so I spent, uh, I had some, some money from the CDC <clears throat> for uh, over four years. And um, early on I started working, around 2002, I started working with a group of people from our high university where I teach. And um, um, we had identified these, the numbers are worse now, but we had identified, you know, 10 years ago that, that things weren't looking really well. And so we started talking to the CDC about the kinds of materials and things that were out there and they were creating for um, minority groups that, uh, you know, there was all of these African-American and Hispanic materials, but there was nothing really that appealed to rural people or that could be used in the Appalachian region. And so I was able to get some funding and uh, worked on developing a toolkit, which I call Diabetes a Family Matter. Um, that work consisted of uh, a lot of things. I did tons of focus groups at first with people with diabetes, family members, community members, lots of different people. Uh, I worked with the Diabetes Coalition we had through the Appalachian Rural Health Institute there. And <clears throat> this was diabetes educators from all over southeast Ohio, tri-state area actually, uh, Kentucky, uh, eastern Kentucky there and, and West Virginia. And so I had a lot of chance to interact with these uh, educators 
around the kind of things they were doing and the kinds of problems. Uh, did a lot of consul consultation with family, excuse me, community experts who are working in organizations and agencies in the community to kind of understand what the services that were available. And I primarily looked in Ohio other than this environmental scan that I had done uh, in App with Appalachia. Uh, so, so I wanted to uh, create in this toolkit some things that were different. I used the term edutainment, so that, that we're educating people, but we're using the concept of entertaining them at the same time. And we're not just giving lectures or uh, just a pamphlet to them that, that's sort of standard, but something that would be just a little bit different. I had a chance to work with uh, many uh, different disciplines in this work. Um, I got to know the people in the College of Communication really well actually had uh, as my GAs over the years uh, several students who were uh, uh, communication majors and graphic artists and other kinds of uh, positions to work with me. Thinking outside the box. Do you ever hear that before? Think outside the box. Well, uh, we hear that and we say that, but I wanted to try to do it. And, um, <clears throat> and it meets some resistance. You know, when you try to do that, people usually say, oh my, you can't do that. Um, but it's okay. That's what they told Florence Nightingale, that she couldn't do that. But she said, oh, I, will, I can do it. I can do it. And so I, I worked with theater students. I worked uh, with film. Uh, I wanted to create a website. And the first thing, this was 2002. People said, people in Appalachia don't use the internet. They don't have computers. 2002. Well, and I said to them, it's probably going to take me a while to get this done. By the time I finish this project, I bet they'll have them, <laughs> right? So when you're developing something, you don't necessarily want to get stuck in the present. You want to look to the future. You know, look at the trends. What are, where are we going? How are things going to be? And what can we do? So uh, the toolkit in, is comprised of a number of things. Uh, there's some photographic journeys of some people, photo novellas or uh, you might be familiar from the Hispanic uh, 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 culture. They use uh, the storybooks that, that are photographs, and it's sort of melodrama. So I wanted to try that. So we created a couple of photo novellas that talk about one, one talks about when your family supports you, and the other is when it, the family doesn't support you. Um, worked with the playwrights. We, uh, uh, I have four plays that are about diabetes in Appalachia that could be used with support groups or community theater uh, locally. Created a series of nine brochures uh, that cover different topics. They're family brochures. They're, they're in what I call a magazine format, lots of big pictures and um, easy writing and a little story uh, to, to uh, teach the lessons. We made a film where people were talking about the problem itself that could be used to show to groups and develop a, a discussion around it. One of the things I learned early on is that diabetes, um, there's a stigma associated with the disease, and so very often people do not want to talk about it. Um, they feel like they did it themselves, or they feel like um, it's their disease, and, and they should bear the burden of it, so there's very little conversation other than get out of that ice cream. I have one fellow told me the story. He said, now this, and this, I'll, t I'll share this because I think it's typical of what we see when we talk about sabotage within families. He said, now my mom, my, my mom knows, you know, now you understand in Appalachia that sometimes mom lives next door, right? So it's not like, you know, she's in California and I'm here, right? <clears throat> so he, he, he says to me, my mom knows I have diabetes. He said, but now I'll go over there this afternoon and she'll have a peach cobbler. And she'll say to me, honey, I made this peach cobbler because I know you love it. And he'll say to, to her, no, now, mom, you know I have diabetes, and I, I'm just not supposed to eat that. Oh, come on, honey, you can have a little bit, right? And so he says, well, I do, and I eat that. And then, then she says to me, wouldn't you like just a little bit more, <laughs> right? And that's what happens all the time. Our families, rather than being supports, throw temptation in our way. If you buy it, it's going to call your name from that closet shelf, right? That's what happens. And so this whole idea of, of thinking about how do we empower local people to talk about this disease, make it visible, it was a lot of what I was thinking about as I've done this work over, over time. 
uh, being culturally sensitive, uh, family, place, and faith are probably the three things that rise to the top when you're uh, thinking about Appalachian culture. And so I wanted to be sure to include those concepts in the materials that we used and made things look rural rather than uh, urban, which most things do look urban. I wanted things to be family focused so that people could pick things up and get some information, even if there was just little ideas, little ideas about things they could do. And I wanted to uh, ad address the low health literacy. So in the written materials, there are uh, sixth to eighth grade uh, reading levels. <clears throat> this then was the proposal. I was going to retire, and then I had this chance to get this other CDC grant, and uh, I decided that I would try that out. And so these um, um, were some of the ideas that I wanted. We had developed the, the culturally relevant tools. I wanted to ultimately be able to use those. You, you hate to spend four years of your life and have something that you think might be good and then put it on a shelf. So I'm not going to read all that to you, but we, we, we've always had specific aims and, and goals aligned with the work that we've done. So when I uh, finished the toolkit, I, I had two years of funding from the CDC, and we did some testing of the toolkit uh, with, with community people. We had 11 different counties over the two years, and this gives you some uh, response. I don't expect you to read it, but we, we, this was an evaluation project, so we did try to evaluate the work that we did. Had a number of students. Uh, one of my, uh, one of the co a communication doctoral student took the plays. And she chose one of the plays and actually used that for her dissertation and took it out in the community and, and tested it and, had, and found out whether it was culturally relevant or not. Yes, it was. So those are good things. I just had a, a DNP student um, uh, use the, the brochures in a, a project that uh, she completed for her DNP to see if they were appropriate for the patient population in Kentucky that she was addressing and found out that they, they were um, some ranking of the toolkit, and this is on a scale of zero to five, and so a uh, fairly good uh, response. Now, you notice down at the bottom there it says website, social networking, All right? So, <clears throat> and this is always the lower thing because I never could, I, I created a social networking thinking, oh good, these people in different counties will talk to each other, and never happened, All right? It didn't work, and I had tried that for years, and it's not worked. So with an older population in Appalachia uh, around a disease entity, I can't say to you, build a social networking and they will come, right? I don't know. Uh, it has not been successful for me. But use of the web has been, right? So this is uh, stats that show um, the, the visits per month in these years, and you can see uh, a rise in the numbers. Uh, this goes on with, this is the year two of the project. And you can see the numbers of unique visitors to the site, which is the most important thing. It's not everything they do, but the fact that they visited the site is usually what we talk about. You can see that there was a growing amount and rather consistent and then um, ongoing. And then I just called the guy the other day uh, to send me stats again. And, um, and, and I'm not doing anything much to promote the site, but it seems to be used. And you can't see April there, but there were over 1,500 unique visitors last month on the website. So somebody's looking at it, right? And, and, and it looks like they're doing a lot of stuff when they get there. And that's so, so um, maybe it's not exact. What control do we really have over things? You know, sometimes you just put things in the public domain and then it gets used for uh, how, however it gets used, and hopefully it will help. So my whole uh, focus has been to um, uh, look at family-focused care and, and looking at uh, strengths. So what I try to do is look at assets or strengths, whether I'm talking about a family or I'm talking about a community, and how is it that you build on those strengths to do. Uh, flexibility, we are not flexible as a, as a discipline. By golly, this is the way it's supposed to be, you know? And when you go back to the AADE and, and the rules for what you're supposed to do, it's sit down, you have 60 minutes, I will tell you everything you need to know. Sorry, I don't have time for questions, we have to get through this. You know? And so we don't have the flexibility that we often need to support people the way they need to be supported. 
So the project that I have now is, uh, it's a five-year project. That should be CDC, obviously. I made a typing error there. Um, and it, it's a $2.5 million project. I have $500,000 a year uh, to, to, with the idea of trying to prevent type 2 diabetes and its complications. Uh, one of the things I ran into right away was, as a project director, I knew that I was an outsider even though I might represent Appalachia, I'm an outsider if I'm not from your county. And so I knew that geog uh, geographically there would be no way I could get to all of these places and, and connected well quickly uh, with people. And so um, in the project we hired, a, I call them a, a county administrative liaison, big title for an eight hour a week job. And uh, I had a little trouble finding a person to work eight hours a week who could qualify to do the things that I needed. But it has turned out to be a really good uh, way to do this. Managing a project from afar, and that's one of the things you get into uh, being concerned about when you're doing rural work, is uh, it takes a long time to drive some places. Right? So that makes, that makes a difference. And then each uh, year of the project, uh, each county gets about $5,000 that they can spend on activities. So $5,000 isn't very much when you're talking 500000 a year. But when you add it all up, what they each get in cash, basically, with the, with the cost for the liaison and some other things, is around $13,000 a piece over five, for each of the five years. And um, plus they get more. Uh, because of the way the program's designed. These are actually the goals for this project. The ones I showed you earlier were the, for the, I'm sorry, were the, for the valuation uh, project. Um, so, so our goals are to strengthen these co uh, county coalitions, map assets, create uh, a strategic plan, uh, address type 2 diabetes and its complications, and create some sustainable actions that can be used when the project is over. Very often we don't focus on that. And these are the counties that are, are involved in, in the project as, at the present time. So um, four in Kentucky, one in Ohio, three in Virginia, and three in Mississippi. So I'm getting to see uh, uh, a breadth of, app and I come right through here. I don't come through here, I come around Nashville when I go to Mississippi. So I get a nice view of the Appalachian region uh, as I'm uh, traveling. Using a socio-ecological model uh, to look at uh, community, and this is a, an evaluation. This is not research. This is an evaluation project. So what we're doing is keeping data from each of the things we do to see what the results are. It's not exactly like research. Because, well, there's no control, right? I, it, but that's the way it often is when you work in a community. I can't can really control things in the same way. If I tried to, I would never get anything done, and that becomes a part. So the first year of the project, um, we, we, um, I found out that community people don't know anything about prevention, and uh, they didn't really like me either. So um, when I came and I told, they had previously had some funding from another source that was gone, and uh, when I came bearing money, they were interested, but when I started talking to them about uh, prevention, they were like, what? You know, and uh, actually had uh, one county, two county, one other one pulled out uh, because they wanted to do what they wanted to do, and if I wouldn't let them, they weren't interested. And so, you know, that's part of what you encounter. We did assessments. Uh, these people uh, uh, in these coalitions, by and large, had never done an assessment. They're not professionals. They're people with diabetes, family members, friends. Um, I don't know that I have ver very many nurses at all in most of these coalitions and no professionals. So we, but we did, a, they learned a lot about their community through doing an assessment. Now, it wouldn't pass what public health wants a, an assessment to be, but it was enlightening for them and it opened their eyes and they began to understand the idea of prevention differently as a, as a, as a result of that. We did storytelling interviews uh, um, I guess I should say I did storytelling interviews with each of the counties and I interviewed at least 10 people or more in every county and we filmed them. I wanted to capture the idea of what's, what's the story, um, you, know, you know, what's your story of living with this disease and what is, what is it like for you and what's available in the community and how can we do better. So I had a whole series of questions that I used and then 
the first year of the project, I pretty much let them do what they wanted because I was trying to be nice. And I wanted to, you know, engage them. And, what, and, and when you walk in as a stranger, uh, you can't tell them everything they're doing is wrong, even if it might be wrong according to our books, right? You have to work with what you have and, uh, and uh, bring folks along with you as you go. So during that first year, I learned some things. Developing trust takes time. They trust me now. They're actually happy to see me, and they give me hugs. So I'm, I'm feeling much better about things. But, it, but that first year and a little bit over a year, I didn't know if I was going to make it or not. Um, you've heard me, some of you have heard me say, when you see one county, you see one county. That in Appalachia, people uh, talk about their counties. They don't talk about their cities, and they identify by county. And so what works in one county or the way it works isn't necessarily the way it's going to work in another rural county. So you have to be open about that. These coalitions, as I already mentioned, are, are largely uh, older, retired people. Uh, um, each county is a little bit different, but they don't look like the coalitions we describe in, in when you take public health courses. Right? They're not what we say works or makes a difference. However, the coalitions function. They got their own way of doing it, but they get their work done. Once they've decided what they want to do, they can make it happen. And they can, in fact, mobilize the community. Of course, having your brother-in-law as the judge and your, your, you know, your sister as a teacher or a superintendent of the school and all those connections make a difference in uh, rural places. In year two of the project, um, um, one of the things they told me during the storytelling was that that they wanted to, um, um, that they really thought that through churches would be a way to address the problem of um, diabetes and get information out. So we started a faith-based um, uh, educational program um, where we're encouraging church health teams. Uh, and we aligned that with the coalition group and uh, I've done uh, two education sessions. Uh, I think I did three the first year, and I've done two this year. So I've done four or five in most of the regional areas now. Um, not talking about doctrine, you know, uh, but largely helping them see that body, mind, and spirit are part of a whole. And that when, if you're thinking about spiritual things, then you also need to think about taking care of your body and your mind and, and, and looking things holistically. It's being uh, received uh, very well in Mississippi, uh, not good at all in Virginia, and, uh, and fair to moderate in uh, uh, Kentucky. All right? So there is differences in regions and openness to ideas or trying something different. Uh, I also made three regional films. I took the, took the videos that we made, and we made three regional films so we can uh, have people um, from each of those areas talking about their disease. And then we distribute them back to the coalition, to the faith-based people and other people in the community so they can show this and watch it on their own television, um, uh, use it in groups or share uh, with others. Um, having local people tell their own story works really nicely and people are much more eager to see themselves than they are strangers talk about boring things they don't want to talk about. So there, there's a tolerance that gets raised in doing that. And I feel like every time someone watches the movie they learn something. Right? So and it creates an opportunity to begin discussing the problem. I also introduce logic models. How many of you know about logic models? Right? <laughs> not very many of you, but um, they were not happy at all with me when I brought that one up. <laughs> and, uh, so, but the, but, but um, the first year, um, um, I felt like I was grading student papers. They'd send it to me, and I'd say, oh, you're on track here. You're getting there. You know, and then I'd write back, and I'd correct some things and send it back to them and say, what about this? And i ask them a bunch of questions. And, and uh, by the end uh, of the second year, for the second year, they actually had developed a logic model. Year three, they're better, right? So people who don't know anything about logic models and making plans and strategies and, and evaluation and outcomes can learn it. Right? But you have to give it to them in pieces. You can't just you know, have too high of expectations the first year. So now, uh, now we're in year three. And, and our program is called Healthy for Good, Healthy for God, um, our faith-based program that we're, uh, that we're doing. 
Um, we completed another film. I wanted to make one that is just about uh, diabetes in Appalachia. You can go on the website and all of these things are there. You can view them and you can download them and uh, copy them onto a disc if, or get our fellow here who's so technically apt uh, to help you do that. Uh, um, they're, you know, they're government funded, so they're available, all of these things uh, for, for your use, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, we made a music CD, right? edutainment, think outside the box, try something different. So um, the Hispanic uh, folks several years ago had uh, uh, created a music uh, uh, CD that they used in some of their exercise programs. And so I had this idea that, well, let's, um, we, we need some original music for our films. And, and I wanted to sort of create some things that maybe would be something, a different way to tell a story. And so um, we, we have seven songs on the CD. You, on the website, you can actually go there and play them. And they're different genres. So there's blues and country and rap and a kid's song and different things with, with messages like old kudzu. Right? You, you all know what kudzu is, right? Yeah. So uh, in that song, we kind of compare what diabetes does to you in your life. It's sort of like kudzu growing on a mountain. And uh, that's in the Virginia film. And the Mississippi, which has the largest obesity rate in the nation, you know, as a state, um, their song is My Eating is Killing Me, and, uh, which is a blues song. And, uh, and they, they liked it. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, so we're doing that. And right now I'm doing town hall meetings uh, because you move from the coalition to the faith-based and now trying to enlist the people in the community, all right? As you build trust, you move outward and doing that. And then um, in year four and five, I intend to uh, um, uh, recruit um, uh, community people to be what I call sugar helpers, all right? And a sugar helper is a community health worker uh, sugar stand is what we call diabetes largely, but I use it as an acronym, uh, support to unite generations in the Appalachian region. And uh, people in my original project just love being called sugar helpers. So, um, so we're gonna be working on that next year. Train, um, my goal is to train three to five people to be sugar helpers in each of the counties I'm working at. So then they can go to the churches or the other places in the community. They won't be professionals, but they'll have a way to talk about the problem and make it visible and hopefully give people enough information that they're alert and attuned to the idea that this is a lifestyle disease. I put the turtle challenge on because this is our, this is our thing we're doing right now that I'm very excited about. Um, um, we all have relays for life or those kinds of things, marathons, which is a uh, afternoon or one day event and often it's to raise money. The turtle challenge is a, a, a eight week challenge. We encourage people to form teams. We call them family teams, but that doesn't have to be. You can adopt anyone as your family. And, and so we have businesses, uh, church, uh, church groups, schools, school kids, um, a variety as we're participating. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, you, you start out, we're slow, we hardly can get out of our chair, but, you know, with the tortoise and the hare, you know, slow and steady wins the race, and so in the end, you can, be, you can become a ninja turtle, right? And so the, uh, the folks in the communities love it. Um, we did it in Ohio and had pretty good success. We had probably about just under 30% of the people who, who participated uh, actually completed the activity. Uh, we learned some things from that and we're doing it right now in Morgan County, Kentucky. And they have uh, almost 400, there's only about uh, 12,000 people in that county and they have about 400 people in the, in the turtle challenge and uh, it's week six and about 86% of the people who signed up originally are actually walking and turning in their documentation. So when we talk about you can't change behavior, well, it's because we haven't found the right thing yet. And, and so we have to find the right thing. And some things work in one place, but maybe not in every place. So we have to keep looking and keep trying. So there's a lot of barriers to change out there. I'm not going to read all this to you. Uh, the slides uh, will be available and um, 
can make them available and so you can have those. Um, uh, let me just talk about uh, um, um, a couple things from here that I think are real important to think about. One is leadership. There's a lack of leadership largely in the Appalachian region. And part of that is because communities have been very closed and it's the same people, it's generational. If your dad was the judge, then chances are you're gonna to run to be judge when you grow up. You know, if you were if the school superintendent, then your kids are probably gonna be in the school. And so the influence seems to carry on. And those people that have been outside those perimeters can't easily break through that, uh, that, that wall that we have created there. And so we have to begin to think different in communities about how it is we engage them. We also need to think about time. Change happens slowly. And this is an important lesson for us as practitioners as well. We cannot expect a person to change everything in a visit or three months or six months. It takes time to change. And we need to applaud the things that they do change. Sometimes everything is not done that you want to have done, but some things have been successful. Look for those strengths, applaud people, commend folks for what they have accomplished, and then build up on that to keep them moving forward. Right? Rome wasn't built in the day. Somebody told me that years ago, and I, I think that we cannot make these, these changes in a day as, as well. And um, be in things for the long haul. If you're going to work particularly in the Appalachian or be in communities, um, even as a practitioner, you have to be in it for the long haul. People have been in Appalachia have been very disappointed by outsiders who have come to save them, come to help them, and they get things going and then whatever funding they had to get them there is gone. And, and so they're going to be skeptical when you come saying this is what we're going to do. But don't give up. Just create a reason for them to trust you. And if you can do that, then over time, uh, you can, I think, build some strong work in, in, in the communities. So I've learned lots of things. Every day I learn something new. I learn a lot about myself. I learned that my, uh, my CV is not impressive when I go to these coalitions. They do not care what I have published, uh, who I have spoken to. Uh, all they want to know is, am I real? Am I authentic? Am I coming back? Am I going to make good on what I told them I was going to do. Let me tell you, the film was a winner for me. When I brought that film back to them, because they were like, yeah, you're going to make a film, you know? All right? But when I brought that film back to them, they were like, oh, there we are, you know? And it seems to me that was one of the points that things began to change, all right? It's producing what you say you're going to produce. Uh, really does make a difference. So uh, hanging in there. Um, one of the things that we know about real change is it takes policy. And one of the things the CDC is very concerned about in this project and others, these are vulnerable populations. So there are six of these grants given um, um, when they were awarded. And um, one went for Asians and Native Americans and a kidney foundation and elderly and I'm leaving out African Americans and and this this Appalachian one uh, was one of these uh, particular grants and and we were to focus on I in my mind focus on four things knowledge uh, behavior uh, uh, environment and policy and policy is like an add-on for us as nurses we don't really think about policy but if you want to make real change you have to address policy because when the regulations change, when, when the law changes, when a formal policy is written, it automatically changes everybody's behavior. Those people are not standing out in front of the hospitals smoking because they want to, right? They're there because there's a policy that tells them that's what they have to do. I, I always remember people smoking on airplanes. Can you even imagine such a thing today? And so sometimes at the beginning of things, I sat in, in the 1980s, I remember sitting in a, a nurse executive meeting at the hospital where the discussion was going on about the fact that we wanted to uh, monitor and reduce the amount of tobacco uh, use. So the fir first rule was, you know, well, visitors can't smoke. Right? That was the first rule policy that we dealt with. And then, then they got to the employees can't. And so then there was this big, but the surgeons got off the elevators, you see, with, with, with uh, cigarettes in their mouth. Now, can you imagine that today? 
right? Policy changed all that. You wore seat belts when you get in the car. You put your child in a, a carrier. That's policy. Without policy, we can't change things. And, and, and you can't change the state or the, the national policy till we get enough people on board to understand local policy, right? So having a, a church agree to no longer have donuts with their coffee on Sunday morning for their Sunday school class doesn't sound like a big thing, but it is a big thing, right? <laughs> that is a policy. And so looking at how can we make the rules a little different. If you have stairs and an elevator, encouraging people to only let the elevator be used for the visitors and for the rest of us who are employed and covered under those health plans to use the stairs would be a smart thing. Right, so how can we incorporate policy? An environment, uh, some, you know, we built this world and it's a mess. And, and we had an idea uh, when we developed automobiles that this is the way the world should look. But the world we built is making us unhealthy. And we have to think about rechanging that. And we can't do it immediately, but we can do small things. And those small things uh, create social networks for change to happen. And as, as clinicians, as, as teachers, as practitioners, as you go through this, uh, your educational uh, work and then graduate and you're out there doing whatever it is you desire to do, you can inspire, you can lead, you can guide, and you can make a difference. And I encourage you all to think about what it, where is your place, what is it you can do, and how can you build on that, not just to get through but to really make a difference in, in what it is that you do over time. Give me the strength to change my way.